environmental education. Uh, we are a professional association of environmental educators in Colorado. And our mission is to advance environmental education by fostering collaboration, mobilizing support, and driving excellence. And we work with about 850 members all across Colorado, uh, together reaching about 800,000 learners in Colorado. One way that we hope to drive excellence in the field is through our monthly webinar series. Um, we try to choose topics that are uh, timely and relevant to the EE community with the goals of sharing and sparking ideas, improving our practice and connecting with one another. Um, we have ha tried to run um, a few more webinars than we typically have in the last couple of months. So we do have another webinar happening next Thursday. And this is by our good friend, Deb Matlock. And she is going to be presenting on deep connections and inspirations, maintaining a sense of hope. Um, and so this is gonna be a really nice hour of just rejuvenating your spirit, remembering why you're in this field and taking a few uh, minutes to just reflect. Um, so we hope that you'll join us on that webinar as well. We do have a whole host of COVID-19 response resources on our webpage. Um, in particularly, we're running bi-weekly conversations around professional development, sustaining operations and adapting program models. And these are just a chance to meet with colleagues online and talk about what's working, what's not working, um, just sharing ideas with one another. And again, all of that is on our website. I just briefly wanted to thank our webinar series sponsor, Marathon. They've sponsored us for over two years now, so we are very grateful for their support. And then a few notes on Zoom. I, I feel like everyone's probably an expert by now. Um, however, just a couple notes. Um, we would love you to keep your lines muted. As I mentioned before, we have um, a lot of participants joining us today. So just to make it the best experience, um, please keep your line muted. Um, and please rely on the chat function to send a message or a question to us. Um, you can ask a question for the presenters, you can post a resource, um, use that chat function to connect with one another throughout the webinar today. And finally, um, you will receive a recording today, so no need to take notes. Um, you will receive that recording in a follow-up email. Finally, one more thing before I introduce our presenters. Um, I just briefly wanted to take some time for a land acknowledgement. So one way that we can support equity is by beginning our time with a land acknowledgement. The history of the United States and Colorado includes a history of purposely trying to erase Native American culture. So it's important whenever we can to center in the place we are and the history that brought us here. We know as what we know as Colorado today was the traditional home of the Apache, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and the Pueblo tribes, as well as the Shoshone tribe and the Ute Nation. And so I'm gonna share just a small part of that history. When gold was discovered in the 1850s, white settlers arrived in Colorado in large numbers and began asserting their right to the land. The Meeker massacre in 1862 resulted in the expulsion of the Ute Nations to Southwestern Colorado and in 1864, the Sand Creek Massacre resulted in the deaths of hundreds of Arapaho and Cheyenne people, and soon after these nations would be relocated out of Colorado. The Southern Ute Indian Tribe and the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe are the two federally recognized tribes that have their current headquarters in Ignacio and Toyak, Colorado. Approximately 50,000 Native Americans live in Colorado today, their rich cultural history is highlighted each year at the Denver March Powwow, featuring over 1,600 dancers. So there are many ways to practice remembering the history of indigenous peoples by reading books by native authors, by including cultural history and programming, by recognizing the culture is alive and vibrant today, or by doing land acknowledgements where you can. And as environmental educators, I invite you to think about how you can do this in your daily work. All right, so without further ado, I want to introduce our great panel of speakers today, and I really want to thank them for um, making time in their schedules and their busy schedules to speak today, because I only gave them about a week heads up, so it was great that they were all able to join us and share their expertise today. So I first want to introduce Keith DeRogers, and Keith joined the Thorne team in 2010 and has a BA in government from Skidmore College and an MA in public administration from the Rockefeller College. Keith has served, 
served as an executive director, development director, or nonprofit consultant for Colorado Environmental Nonprofit since 1997. Keith has extensive knowledge and experience in the areas of strategic planning, fundraising, operational efficiency, and board development. So next we have Paul Dreyer. And Paul, a self-proclaimed mercenary educator, has had the opportunity to work with numerous organizations, including Knowles, Where There Be Dragons, HMI, and the Watershed School. Paul has worked throughout the world as a facilitator, curriculum designer, coach, expeditionary leader, risk management consultant, staff trainer, and team builder. And currently, Paul is the CEO of Avid for Adventure, helping support the mission to empower kids to lead active and healthy lifestyles outdoors. And finally, we have Stacy Forsyth. And Stacy is the director of CU Science Discovery, a K through 12 STEM education outreach organization based at CU Boulder. CU has been delivering so summer program, or sorry, summer camps in Boulder for nearly 40 years, along with school programs, teacher professional development workshops, and other community outreach programs. Their programs include field science and environmental education programs, as well as a range of other STEM disciplines, including math, physics, computer science, and engineering. So again, thank you all for joining us, and I will let Keith get us kicked off here. Awesome, thank you. Um, thanks for everyone for joining. It's so important that we're always learning from each other instead of just reinventing wheels as we uh, go along. And uh, I'll just say special thanks to Paul, who's been a great ally of mine um, over the last uh, eight weeks here as we've tried to uh, redevelop our camps um, so that we can be successful this summer and into the future. Um, I'm going to give a kind of brief summary of like the decisions that we've made and how they've impacted our organization. And just know that I'm barely going to scratch the surface on what's been weeks and weeks and months of work at this point to try to offer a safe and reliable camp uh, this summer. So really early on, eight weeks ago, our staff was just like, there is no way that camp is gonna run as normal. And uh, we began working on new models for our camp. We kind of set out some goals and at first we start off with, the, in order of importance, we were looking to ensure the safety of our campers first and foremost. We wanted to make sure that whatever we offered would be reliable for parents because parents would be depending on us for childcare this summer um, and not wanting us to flake out on them at the last second. We wanted to retain our full-time staff. Um, we've got a team of about 20 folks here and we wanted to keep them all employed through the summer. Normally we hire about 35 seasonals, but our real goal was retaining full-time staff Minimizing liability for our organization, uh, maximizing revenue, which actually is just in this case minimizing losses because we have more in fixed expenses for camp than we're going to bring in in revenue this year. And uh, last but not least, uh, meeting the, uh, or last and least in this case, meeting the community need for childcare. Um, we'd love to be able to do more, but that just wasn't, wasn't a place that we felt was something we're going to be able to deliver a lot on this year. So. When we looked at those goals, um, we, we tested out a lot of different ideas about how we might run camp this summer. And interestingly, you'll hear from Paul at Avid, like we both sort of kind of came in at the same conclusion, which was the right way to go was with small group size camps. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But uh, for our own organization, uh, long before the state decided that 10 was a safe number, we decided five was gonna, five or fewer would be a safe number. The other thing that we decided early on was that we were going to run two week sessions. So normally folks can sign up for one uh, week of our camp, but we wanted to minimize the number of groups that our instructors were working with for their safety and for the safety of the campers. It's also a reliability issue. If you imagine that our staff member is a vector between one group of kids and another. And so we didn't want to potentially be transferring COVID from one large group of kids at 10 or 12, which we normally operate. We are down at five. But by working with kids for two weeks in the same group, we have less chance of being a vector and less chance of potentially having to shut down a camp. Um, so that was an important decision for us. So we're doing, we're offering these small group size camps through two different uh, programs. One's open enrollment. And basically that means that like any parent can say like, hey, I want one of your uh, five spots. And the other one is called our Choose Your Own Adventure Camp, which is private. And basically a parent could say like, hey, I want all your spots and I wanna be able to pick the teacher and I wanna be able to pick 
which open space areas the kids are going to go to each day and things like that. One thing that's definitely different about our camps this year um, than in normal, normally we take kids to a different open space area every day on a big bus. This year, there will be no buses. So camp is gonna be at the same place every day for the two weeks, except we may do field trips uh, if the parents provide the transportation to and from a site. You know, it's very tricky because when we're working in these outdoor sites, we wanna make sure that there's grounded uh, shelters for electrical storms. Like if we don't have a big bus on site to transport kids, we really need to make, be careful about the locations that we choose for camp. And so um, it's, uh, it's most likely we're gonna be operating just out of these sort of uh, some real uh, key areas this summer. Um, we were um, very quick to act about basically saying that like our, our, everyone that enrolled in our camp, we already had $400,000 in camp sales on, uh, on when COVID sort of kicked off and we were we were really quick to just sort of say like hey like we know this isn't going to work and 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 we we want a new model we launched our new model on april 21st and uh we were avid and i were we were within a, a day of each other and um thorn sold out within 12 hours so just with existing campers we sold 100 percent of the spaces that we were going to be able to offer um, one thing that I'll throw out there in case it's useful and for organizations that haven't canceled their existing camps already or haven't dealt with parents that they're going to have to unenroll or re-enroll in a new type of program. We found there was about a 45-55 split. It was just under 50-50 of parents that wanted their money back versus parents that wanted to make sure their kids got into camp this summer. So if you have currently a bunch of campers enrolled, um, my guess is that if you offer the opportunity to get their money back, we did, we offered folks a chance for 100% refund. Um, about 50% of them are gonna take it and about 50% are gonna wanna, wanna sign up again. Um, one thing that we did was we gave people an option to donate back to our organization um, and 25% of the folks that asked for refunds donated an average of $100 per family. So. That's about $15,000 in free money that we're gonna get. Um, it's it's uh, peanuts in comparison to the 450,000 that we're losing by switching to the small group size model, but it is uh, every little bit's helping at this point. Um, to date, we have only enrolled four youth in our camps. I know some of you aren't from the state of Colorado, but those that are in the state of Colorado might understand the reason that we did that because we can operate as a licensed exempt camp if necessary which means that it's highly unlikely that someone can shut us down. Um, the, we really, really wanted to make sure that we came up with a model that was the least likely to be impacted by future decision-making by public health, childcare licensing, open space departments, school districts. We rely on so many of these other organizations and we knew that they weren't gonna make decisions on our timeline. Um, just, yes, just today we got our open space permits. Um, just yesterday we heard from child care licensing that they weren't going to allow mobile day camps or outdoor based day camps. And they had told us four weeks ago that they were going to allow both of those things. So we didn't trust them. <laughs> I mean, we trust them, but we didn't completely trust that, that they knew what they were saying at that point in time. And by only enrolling four kids, we can op operate as a licensed exempt camp. And so all of the folks that we've enrolled to date are going to be able to come to camp with us under the current state guidelines, which were just released. Um, we are hopeful that at some point our local school district is going to let us know that we can use some of their facilities, at which point we will have licensed daycare centers and then we will enroll up to five kids per camp. But currently we're, we're only enrolling at four kids. And as you know, we're 100% sold out with a waiting list that is three times the number of spaces that we have to begin with. So um, let's see. I think the other thing, what else would I want to say? Um, we're gonna see about 225 kids this summer. That's in comparison to the normal 2,000. I already mentioned that we were losing about $450,000, but what we are doing is bringing $150,000 in revenue in. That $150,000 in revenue is critical. My organization has a burn rate of about $80,000 a month for uh, staff expenses. And so right there, we're basically covering our summer staff expenses with the revenue that we're bringing in. Um, again, our fixed expenses on camp, you know, things like the CampMinder database that costs us $7,000 or our marketing for our camps, all of those, that money is gone. 
there's nothing we can do about it. We never would have spent it if we knew we were only going to bring 150,000 in in camp. But but it's a it's right now we're really sort of looking at like the the survival of our team, and so uh, we want to live to fight another day. Um, let's see. Can yeah, I think. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry to interrupt, but there was a question about whether you were enrolling. Is it four kids or five? We're only enrolling four. Our, we told parents we were enrolling five, but we've only enrolled four to make sure that we have the opportunity to operate as a as a exempt licensed child care center. Um, and if, as soon as we enroll five, we would have to be a licensed child care center. And some of our camp locations operate with mobile licenses um, and outdoor based licenses. And so right now, if we had enrolled in five, hoping that was going to be the case, we wouldn't be allowed to operate. I hope that makes sense to folks. Um, I want to say something about scholarships. Uh, we decided as an organization to uh, continue to ensure that one in five of our students was on 100% scholarship. I mean, even though our organization is losing all this money and we're really worried about you know, long-term sustainability and, and all the, the, the challenges that COVID are gonna, is going to bring our way for, for years, I'm sure, um, we felt that it was important to continue to serve our low income and Latino community. And to be honest, I hope any camp that can do this will do this because the families that are getting hurt the most are those that are most vulnerable. And we need to serve them to whatever capacity that we can. So I'm really proud that Thorne is able to give uh, will be about thirty-five or forty thousand dollars in scholarships this year. It's so much smaller than we normally do. It's usually around one hundred and fifty or sixty. I will say this though. Again, I think when you do the right thing, good things happen. You know, we I already said that people donated to us when we asked them to cancel camp, or we told them we were canceling their camp. They made donations to us. Two days ago, I got a new donor, seventy-five thousand dollars. They said they wanted to pay for one hundred percent of our scholarships this summer. Um, they were really excited about what we were doing with scholarships. This is a brand new donor, and they, they literally learned about us through our response to COVID-19 and what we've been doing in the community. And so I think when you do the right thing, the money's going to show up, and I just wanted to say that. I'm going to put in the, uh, I'm going to stop talking, answer questions later, but I'm going to put inside the chat uh, a link to our FAQ that really explains how we're responding to COVID and our new cancellation policies and our health policies and all the different things that parents are asking us about. And I do encourage any of you that don't want to recreate that stuff, just copy what we wrote and use it for yourselves. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me directly as well. Thanks. Great, thanks Keith. And there was just a couple other questions. Um, one person just wanted clarification that it is a two week program, correct? Yeah, we decided to go with uh, two-week programs as a means of minimizing uh, the the number of kids that were being exposed to each other and number uh, the number of kids our instructors were exposed to. Great, and then and there's, one, and there's one week off in the middle. So our teachers will work two weeks on, one week off, which will give them nine days between groups, which minimizes the potential that they're a vector between one group and another. Sorry if I didn't make that clear before. Great, and another question came in about what type of childcare license you do have. Um, we have a preschool license, a mobile license, an outdoor childcare license, and three site-based licenses across our organization. Um, this summer, we're hoping to operate under two out two site-based licenses, and um, as of right now, we've kind of lost hope that we're going to be able to operate under our mobile and outdoor licenses. And we're not doing preschool age camp this summer because, well, we're going to have one group of kids that are already enrolled in our preschool that have been with our teacher for an entire year. We feel safe working with them, but we know that the younger kids are, the harder it's going to be to manage safety precautions related to COVID. And so we've decided not to have preschool camps for new, um, new enrollees. And then one other question was, um, how many hours a day is it running for? We're gonna run from 8.30 to 2.30. Um, typically we offer aftercare. We're not gonna do that this year. Um, 
we, we get into too much trouble with afternoon thunderstorms and we want to avoid being indoors with kids this year. So we just felt that aftercare really requires some indoor time, both from a AC sort of standpoint as well as from th thunderstorms. Awesome. Oh, more questions. How about overnight camps? Um, we do not operate. Well, we typically have a couple of overnight camps. I'll let Paul talk. Paul has, Paul's got a whole overnight <laughs> camp, So I'll take that. That's a, that's a great segue, Ashley. <laughs> Lisa, you want me to just dive in? Um, sure. Well, let me check with Kat, make sure we don't have any questions via Facebook. And um, we have another staff person, Kat Riley, monitoring our Facebook page. Are there any questions for Keith on our Facebook page, Kat? No questions at the moment. All right. Well, keep the questions coming on and we will turn it over to Paul now. Great. Thanks so much. And before I dive in, just a few gratitudes here. I feel uh, just tons of gratitude to be sharing the virtual stage with, uh, with Keith and Stacy. So great to see you all. Um, also, just tons of thanks to CAE, um, Katie and Lisa for putting it all together. And, uh, and tons of gratitude. It's so fun to see um, names and faces and organizations that I've known for, for so many years on the screen and, and also just so many new names and new organizations truly from around the country. So uh, thanks everyone for, for joining us. Um, as you'll hear, and as Keith mentioned, both of our organizations are overlapping in many ways. And I think Keith and I hopefully have role modeled well how we we our two organizations have worked together. So you'll hear some similarity. Uh, and then I'll, I'll try to um, add on just a, a bunch of other complexities and other things that we brought to our conversation. Uh, Avid for Adventure, um, our, our mission is to empower kids to, to be outdoors for, for life. And we do that, uh, as I alluded to with Ashley's questions, not only through day camps, we run tons of day camps similar to Keith, but also uh, overnight camps in two different formats, overnight camps as resident, uh, classic sleepaway camps, and also week-long camping expedition camps. A um, couple other things that, that are just different out and to add to the conversation, um, we, perhaps differently than a lot of you all on the call, we're structured as a for-profit for company. Uh, we're a, a benefit B Corp uh, corporation. And so it, it just um, enables us to, to act more quickly and more nimbly perhaps. And uh, often that is helpful for other organizations that, that we provide some learnings in that way. Um, we also are based in Colorado, but we operate in five different states. Um, so day camps and overnight camps in Colorado, California, Oregon, Washington, and Minnesota. So we're able, we, we, we are needing to know, um, just uh, be in touch with different state health departments and regulations across uh, varying different states. I know you all are calling in from all across the country, but, but hopefully some of our learning can be transferable to, to you all in different states. Um, you know, to, to, to kind of truly dive into our situation, mimicking a lot of what Keith was saying, um, we will do, we were able to pivot and ideally are unro unrolling um, and, and thankfully are unrolling alternative programs. Even with those alternative programs, um, best case scenario, we're hoping to re recoup about 30% of the revenue that we were planned for, anywhere between 25 to 30% uh, of revenue. Um, and as Keith mentioned, our, our summer staff were, you know, a big goal of ours was to keep as many people employed as possible. This summer, uh, if we were fully enrolled in doing what we were hoping for for 2020, we would have had 750 seasonal instructors working AVID programs. And instead this year, we'll have 250. So a huge decrease, um, but we are also just really thankful that we were able to pivot into these alternative programs to still employ um, hundreds of folks, as, as we know, um, the unemployment across the country is just truly dramatic right now. Um, I'll, I'll talk for a moment about the overnight camp, uh, our overnight camp um, decisions that we've made and then focus uh, mostly on the day camps because I think that's where most of the questions are on this call. For the overnight camps, as I mentioned, we typically run resident camps and uh, week-long expedition camping programs which for us are mostly car camping base camp. We do do some backpacking trips as well. Most of our expeditions are, are base camp car camping. Uh, we have made the decision to cancel all of our resident camps for the summer. So our classic sleepaway camps, we have two locations of those typically. 
one. Um, typically, there's about 150 people that are on site at any given time. And at the other resident camp, about 250 uh, on site at any given time. And we have canceled those, going back to what Keith said earlier, purely based on group size. You know, even though within that 150 community, 250 community, we're mostly in small groups, it's just with, with one person even possibly contracting COVID-19, it is putting the hundreds of people um, in danger. And not only those hundreds of people in that um, small, in that um, enclosed resident camp facility, but then all those folks going back into their communities, into the, their homes. So for us, it was just the right thing to do to cancel resident camp for the entire summer. Um, but we are, uh, we are, have decided to run very purposely and intentionally all of our expedition camps and limiting those to a group size of 10 or fewer. And those really, they, they don't meet at any location. Um, the group meets together and they, and they are never with other folks. They're just with their two instructors, up to 10 kids. And then they are uh, a self-contained unit in a, a private camping experience, kind of away from other folks. They don't need to, to engage with any other folks during that week of camp. Um, so we feel through really great health screening, we are still talking about testing for, for the, those expedition groups. Um, obviously, that's still such a moving target right now, testing. But we are moving forward with that small group expedition overnight camps, but canceled uh, resident camps. And then on the day camp side of things, we have canceled all of our day camps as we know them, right? So our day camps. Um, I'm sure many of you can picture the scene that many groups coming together in one central drop-off pickup location where again hundreds of folks come together and then our model typically is those groups get into 15 passenger vans and travel to nearby recreation sites to go climbing and hiking and paddling and biking. So we have canceled all of that, that model completely to really avoid the large group meeting areas and to fully just take away transportation uh, through 15 passenger vans. And, and instead, we have three different alternative day camp options. Um, and each of them talk to different risk tolerances that parents may have or may not have during this summer. Um, two of them are in-person day camp options and one of them are virtual day camp options. So just to go through those one, one, one by one, the first option that, that's a pivoted alternative day camp it's what we call small group adventures. And this is similar to one of Keith's models in that parent, these are groups of no more than five, so four or five kids, one instructor. Um, kids sign up for one week of camp, Monday through Friday, similar timing, uh, nine o'clock to three o'clock, so six hours, full day camp. And, and these are our technical core sports. So as I mentioned, parents sign up for a week of rock climbing, a week of mountain biking, or a week of paddle bit, paddling. And instead of meeting at one central facility and we transport, parents drop off at the nearby trailheads, rec areas, reservoirs, and creeks. So we will meet at different locations each day, but parents will drop off at those trailheads and those reservoirs, and they just meet their instructor. They have the same instructor with that four, those kid, four or five kids for the whole week. So those are small group adventures. That, that's what's kind of most similar looking to the day camps that, that parents have had already signed up for. So that's for like the, the parent that has the most risk tolerance. Now stepping that down, our next alternative day camp um, offer is what we call camp at home. And as the name implies, this is where um, our instructor, one instructor uh, from Avatar Adventure shows up at a parent's house and the parent has put together their group. So this is a private, um, we started this idea calling it adventure nannying, where you kind of get that nanny for the week, and it's a private, customized, curated experience, Monday through Friday. Still full, full day, nine o'clock to three o'clock. Um, our instructors will have a kit with them for the whole, whole summer, where they're able to um, unroll a, a curriculum that is about uh, wildlife education and outdoor cooking and navigation, LNT, skill, uh, LNT skills, uh, emergency response and first aid camping skills for kids, all of that unfolds in, in somebody's backyard or nearby parks and green spaces. So we are after the Monday morning, um, this is really a chance for the instructor to customize the week of camp so they can decide with the parents involved where 
on Tuesday and Thursday, we'll meet at the nearby camp, uh, nearby park, excuse me, uh, five minutes away or 10 minutes away. So it is a, a mobile based, just in and around a parent's house um, called Camp at Home. And we have heard from parents that they really, many parents with a slightly less list to uh, risk tolerance this summer, want to control who their kids are with. So instead of the open enrolled group, they really, they're okay with their kids being with other kids, as long as they know those other kids. So that's the camp at home. And then our, our third alternative day camp is our online camp. And we've actually been running this for the last four weeks, just testing it. Um, and this is, we really wanted to, you all know that, that what makes camp really special in the summer. Sure, we all do different activities and cool things like rock climbing and environmental education. But what makes it most special is the connection kids have mostly with your staff, right? Your instructors and your counselors. So we really wanted to bring that to an online format. So we've created this interactive week long, uh, parents sign up for Monday through Friday, only two and a half hours a day, because that's enough screen time, right? And they can choose a morning and an afternoon option. And then they get a dedicated instructor that really just like all camp experiences, that instructor through the week gets to know kids even through screens. And it's a combination of live activities and pre-recorded, but always curated. There's always that live um, instructor that's watching and knowing and calling on kids throughout the week. Um, and so that's our online adventure camp. And that builds in a bunch of outdoor skills, um, also nature-based and outdoor-based uh, uh, yoga, movement, dance, um, art, and music activities, all nature-based, happening in and around the house in the backyard. Um, and, and just a little plug on that, we, we have been running them um, during these school, the final weeks of school as well, because we know parents really just need support right now. And so um, I'll send, I'll put it in the chat box when I'm done talking here, but would love to offer anyone in your communities that are parents that just need help right now with, uh, to, to test out our online camp. We are running those camps um, every week in May as well as through the summer. So happy to um, give a super low cost uh, uh, online camp to, to any parents or I, I know many of you on this call are parents as well. So happy to offer that to, to you all. Um, and, um, and the last thing that I'll say is just wanted to also in the chat, um, and, and Keith has already mentioned this, that I am just personally happy to be of support and connection to all of you all happy to share as Keith did with things on our website and I, I think he, all, in addition to that um, have offline of this conversation just personal um, conversations with you all through email or phone so I, I will in the chat box put my um, communication my my contact information so feel free if anything that I said is tangentially related to your all's programs or can help with decision making uh, happy to be of support to you and moving forward and I'll, I'll stop there, Lisa, I'll see what questions uh, came up. Yes, there are many. I'm trying to think of where to start. Um, well, back on your expedition programs, there was um, a few questions related to that. I'm gonna kind of wrap them up into one question. So when are you starting those? Do those have the same transportation protocols? And with those expedition camps, are youth sharing things like tents and utensils and things like that? Yeah, great questions. Um, we have delayed the start. Typically, our expeditions start mid-June, and we have delayed uh, that till the very end of June, really, like July 1st, while our, our first expeditions will go out. So that still is um, a month and a half away. So your other questions around eating and sleeping and transportation, still in flux with us for you know, full transparency. Um, mm -hmm. We are still, we are for those expeditions planning to use 15 passenger vans, and really, working with the ACA um, right now and awaiting guidance there on how to, and, and also state of Colorado, to um, best cleaning procedures for those 15 passenger vans, but we are planning to use those for transportation. And we're in conversations uh, about tents right now. We're again, awaiting guidance. We're ready to share tents with kids. We're also um, have, luckily have the capacity and it's car camping for us and not backpacking. We are also ready to bring twice as many or four times as many shelters and tents with us to potentially have every kid in their own tent or instead of four kids in a tent have two kids in a tent um, you know in the state of colorado there are some licensing um, guide marks uh, for resident camp like that all beds have to be two feet away from each other currently there's no guidance for that in tents but we are expecting that guidance to come so when we get that guidance 
we are able to pivot to whatever is needed to be. Um, typically, we have four kids in a tent, and we're ready to, to, to do that or do something different depending on what, what the latest requirements are. Um, and hopefully, those will come by the end of this month. Great. Um, there's another good question about risk management, considering you only have one group leader. Um, so how are they supported in case of emergency? Yeah, you bet. So the, those day, day camps, we already, even before COVID-19, we ran camps with only one instructor and small group size. Um, so we ran learn to, learn to bike programs with four or five kids and, and one, um, one instructor. We also have a, a bike park program that We've, we've been running for many years with one instructor and up to seven kids. Um, so, so we're used to that model. We're used to training to that uh, on a risk management standpoint. Um, in terms of emergency response, our groups are, are we're very fortunate that we're always in uh, cell coverage. Our, so we're able to, our camp directors are, are close by and can respond. Um, and all of our staff are trained um, to handle initial emergency responses. Um, for, for those circumstances. So it's actually not, not hugely new for us. Um, a question around the one instructor has come up from our instructors, and I'm sure you all train to the same that we, we will continue to train that there should never be a circumstance where one instructor is alone with a kid, so a one on one situation. But as long as there's one instructor and more than you know, a group of kids and, and potentially other folks around, but we're not too concerned for, about that from a risk management standpoint. Great, and then there are a couple questions uh, around the um, virtual camps um, yeah. about what format and how many kids you use and the cost of those. Great, yeah, great questions. Um, we use Zoom as a platform, so we've kept it pretty easy. Uh, we're able to plug in pre-recorded videos that, that we've made, plus a bunch of live content. We use the chat feature uh, when, when we can. They, we do divide the kids up um, by age. Those programs are for uh, first through fifth graders and then divided further by, by age grouping. And the group size for that is 17 kids, up to 17 kids and one instructor. We've tested different amounts of kids. We, we've had 10 kids, we've had 15 kids, and we've had uh, 17 kids. And we really love the group size of 17. We have not had group management issues of that. And, and as I said before, our instructors are really able to still have personal connections with up to seven, 17 kids. And the, in terms of pricing for that, um, that's for a week of camp, Monday through Friday, two and a half hours a day, uh, $99 for the whole week. Great. And I'm going to ask Kat to maybe share one or two questions, and then we'll move on to Stacy. So Kat, could, do you have some Facebook questions for us? Yeah, we just had one question that was actually posted here just now, so I believe it was answered um, regarding um, the licensing, and if so, how does home-based programming work with licensing? Yeah, I, I do see, Christina, your question in the chat feature. We, we are licensed very similar to, um, to what Keith was saying. We have the, those same license licenses in the state of Colorado. Um, in other states where we operate, for example, California, we don't need to be licensed because there is no licensing for camps there. So it depends on the state a little bit, but in Colorado, we are licensed. And similar to what Keith was saying, because of our group size, we come underneath the licensing requirements in, in Colorado with the camp at home model that, we're, that I was mentioning. I, I got one sneaky addition to add there, Paul, too. If you want to run camp at home, um, you can run it as a mobile camp, and the cross street uh, can be your mobile location, and the home can be your field trip. Um, the state's not currently allowing mobile licenses, but they might later this summer. So you could enroll four kids in camp at home, and then later this summer hope to maybe extend that to five or six or a higher number of kids if, if that's what you're hoping to do. Great, thanks so much, Keith. Thanks, thanks everyone. I'll put some info in the chat box and, uh, and I'll turn it back over to you, Lisa. Okay, great. And there are a few more questions, but I just wanna make sure we um, get to Stacy as well. So we'll maybe take some more at the end. So keep, keep chatting them in. Um, but yeah, let's have Stacy talk about uh, CU Science Discovery Program. Okay, great. I just have a couple of slides I'm gonna pull up, hopefully. All right, so for those of you who might not be familiar, um, I'm the director of CU Science Discovery, which as was mentioned in the beginning, is a K-12 STEM education outreach program based at the University of Colorado Boulder. We've been around for almost 40 years and we run a whole variety of STEM education programs. So across a whole uh, variety of disciplines, 
including environmental education and field programs, but also um, biological sciences, physical sciences, engineering, computer science, so a whole, whole range. And we're working with kids as young as five all the way through high school. So when uh, all of this began happening, the university was one of the first organizations to shift and kind of shift to remote work and remote learning um, a few days before our local school district did. And we kind of immediately went into the zone of thinking about what we might do to be able to continue some of our uh, STEM programs during the summer if we weren't able uh, to offer our in-person summer camps. So it was, I would say it would be, a, it was about another month before the university announced that uh, there would be no in-person programs on the university campus this summer. So um, in our case, the in some ways, the decision was made for us. We didn't have the option of running in-person camps at all on campus. Um, and we were preparing for that. So it certainly wasn't a surprise. And we were just thinking about the best way to that we could go forward. Um, in terms of our transition that we've made to offering remote programs for the coming summer, we've really scaled down what we offer. So we're uh, planning to offer about half the number of camps that we typically offer in a given summer. I imagine it might end up being less than that, depending on how registrations go. Um, we're obviously having to do all of our student recruitment and signups in a very short amount of time. Uh, we just opened our registration at the beginning of May, so we have about a month uh, before our camps start. We really narrowed the camp topics that we're offering this summer, really focused on uh, topics that don't require specific uh, locations on campus, don't require specific technology that students are unlikely to have at home, and also um, kind of disciplines and topics that would allow and support independent work. One of our challenges is um, we really want to offer kids things that are going to get them away from the computer, um, but in offering them in this remote format, we know that the computer is our tool for connecting with the students. So that's been this tension of thinking about how can we connect with this group and engage kids online, but also provide additional activities that are going to keep them creating and building and engineering and tinkering, um, using materials that either we provide or that they might have at their house. Um, so really narrowing down our camp topics for things that would support that type of format. All of our camps are going to um, combine some type of synchronous class meeting time over Zoom, again, with that independent work time. And we've designed the camps um, different lengths of time for that synchronous meeting, depending on age level. So for the younger kids, we're really limiting it to like a 30 minute short class time, then with some additional things they can do with some video instruction and with some additional activities. And then longer class times, an hour and a half, two hours, three hours for some of the older age groups. Um, some of our classes are computer science and programming classes that uh, transition really well to this format. And others are either going to be involving materials that kids can find, recyclable things and materials they might find uh, in their backyard or in their house. In other cases, uh, we also have some classes where we're planning to provide um, families with a materials kit. So some of our key considerations as we started looking um, at making this transition, um, you know, in, in terms of using a virtual space, what that was going to look like, we wanted to wanted to make sure that it was a secure space. Um, we've been really involved with youth protection efforts on our campus and um, in developing policies that really serve to protect the youth in our programs. We also have a policy of having two adults in our camps. And so we typically have a model where we have an instructor and a teaching assistant supporting that instructor. So we wanted to continue that um, even in this remote format. Accessibility, thinking about um, what kind of technology kids have at home. Can we minimize the technology they might need in order to connect to the, to the camp? And then also thinking about accessibility for students with different needs, making sure that any materials we were posting online um, were compatible with screen readers and, and accessible for different audiences. And then, um, of course, in terms of the pedagogy piece, how can we work with and support our instructors to make sure that they can effectively engage with this group online? We know that you know, kids have been home for the past several months. They've uh, really lost out on a lot of that peer-to-peer -peer interaction they normally have. Um, and I know I've been really pleased. I have a, a 10 and a 13-year-old, 
and their remote learning has looked very different this spring. And for my 10 year old, they've had a lot of synchronous class meeting time and that's been really, really helpful for him. So just a lot of time to engage um, with his friends and with his teacher. So we're trying to build that in. In terms of just some of the tools that we're using, I just wanted to share some of what we've kind of learned as we've sort of, you know, entered into this whole process. If you are thinking about um, entering programs virtually, these are some of the tools that we're, we landed on. We're planning to do our class meetings over Zoom, um, largely because we can use breakout rooms to divide that group up and um, we can have kids work in smaller groups on certain tasks, have them engage in smaller discussions, um, working to kind of use some of the security features, I'm sure everybody's heard about Zoom bombing and other things. So trying to protect uh, the youth in our programs from people <laughs> barging in that aren't supposed to be there. So Zoom now has a number of features, including passwords and waiting room feature. We weren't, we've had the benefit um, in terms of our connection to the university, we've had the benefit of connecting with folks at the university who have done a lot with online learning. One of the challenges has been that the university's tools that they make available to their students are not available to our students. Um, so some of the learning management tools that CU typically supports for undergraduates, uh, our students wouldn't have access to. So that's been of a little bit of a hurdle for us. Um, we've landed on, we're using Google Sites. It's a free and easy tool um, where we're building class websites so that we can really put all the class materials for a given camp in one place and it makes it really easy and user friendly for families to find what they're looking for for a particular camp. Um, and then we're also going to be using a tool called Padlet, which uh, essentially is like an online bulletin board that we can use for different classes. So an instructor can use it to communicate different things as the class goes uh, throughout the week. And then students can also uh, respond and post some of the work that they're doing so that they can share some of what they're doing during that independent time. Um, and here are just a few of the resources that we've found helpful. I put our website here if you want to kind of check out what we're doing. but um, the After School Alliance recently gave a really nice webinar that had a lot of resources for virtual programming. Um, that included some resources from OutSchool, which does a lot of uh, virtual programming. And CU Boulder has recently updated its uh, youth program guidelines for virtual programs. So some of those links might be helpful if you're looking for uh, to switch to this format. Great, thanks, Stacy. Are there any questions for Stacy in the virtual programs that they're starting up there? There's one just posted. How much are you charging for camps that require the kids? Ah, <laughs> uh, no, the the camp. There's not just one set price. So, um, we are charging an extra fee for kits. Typically, it's like a twenty five dollar fee for the materials kit. One of the things that we're not sure about is we basically design them primarily thinking local, but wanting them to be accessible for people in other parts of the country as well. So um, we're planning to do like a curbside pickup each week for local uh, campers, but then shipping kits to people who are out of, out of town. What's interesting, I thought that um, you know, families, I think, are kind of tired of this remote learning and having their kids on the screen all the time. So we thought that that, that would be a big draw, having kits that offered this hands-on piece away from the computer. I would say our enrollments have been much higher in our computer science camps than in our <laughs> hands-on kits. So go figure. Kat, are there any questions from the Facebook page? Yeah, so just a couple questions. Um, regarding for uh, in-person programs, will there be any physical distancing between participants enforced? And if so, how? And I think that could be for Paul or Keith. Yeah, I'm happy to give a first take and, and hear Keith too, uh, Keith's response. Uh, it, I mean, the short answer is we'll, we'll do the current, we'll, 
we'll do the current recommendations come June 15th when we start those camps. So absolutely, we don't want any special permissions or, or doing anything different than, than what uh, we would be doing in, in the public. So if we're remaining physically distant six feet or more, then we will uh, do the best we can to, to do that uh, at camp as well, as well. As we know, that, that's difficult and that's part of our training that we'll be uh, doing with our instructors of how to do that with kids and uh, in different ages as well. And we're also, you know, we're communicating to our parents and our staff that we would be lying to ourselves if, we're, if we could pledge that that's gonna happen. We do rock climbing camps and so we, we have to fit harnesses to kids and there's an emergency circumstance where a, we're paddle boarding with the kid and we need to help them in the water. So absolutely, we, we will um, not shy away from saying we will try to keep physically distance. We will try to have PPE on, PPP on, PPE, excuse me, on um, gloves and masks. And there will be times where we will not be physically distanced and not be able to get gloves on fast enough to get a kid out of the water or something like that. Um, and, and that we're, we're willing to lean into that risk and be risk tolerant as an organization, um, but we will try our hardest to, 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 to keep those physical distance, whatever is recommended. I think, I think similar to what Paul said, um, you know, one of the advantages to kind of not waiting for, you know, state child care licensing or the, the ruling that came out just a couple of days ago was to be able to make a decision so that we could stop worrying about whether we're running camp or what size groups and, and just be able to design the camp in the safest way possible. So for the last couple of weeks, we've really been focused on like, how do we actually do this safely? And some of it is redesigning our curriculum so that we know like what, act like we're gonna have our staff training this weekend and we have a whole bunch of new activities that our, our teams put together that we can do with kids that allow to be done at a safe distance. And so, um, I think that, uh, I think it's all possible. It's all better than the next best option, which is for these kids to be home with nothing to do, stuck inside their houses, looking at screens. Like, and um, it's not gonna be camp as usual. It's not gonna be as fun and as engaging, but we can totally do all of this uh, as safely as possible. And one other thing that I would add on that, just I mentioned the risk tolerance piece on this, that again, we would be lying to ourselves if we can stay physically distanced if we it doesn't matter how much screening or testing we do we can't reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19 to zero but what we can do is really look at our group size and say all right if if, if somebody if a staff or a camper or a parent uh, if is contracted with uh, COVID-19 and and that is transmitted to our group we're still reducing the spread of the virus if we have much smaller group sizes so so that is something that we can do because, as Keith mentioned, just mentioned so well, the, the benefits just outweigh that risk, though that smaller risk. Just as a follow-up, there is a question about whether you've had to update things like your waivers, liability, insurance coverage for those small group um, adventures. For sure. Thanks, Paul shared his with our team. Our lawyers are still working on ours. Um, I mean, the most important thing is making sure that parents know all of the, the risks that they're taking by sending their kids to your camp. And we do that in our waivers. We also do it in our FAQs. We do it with our parent communication. The, you know, we're gonna, we're not giving people a copy of our health policy right now because we know it's gonna change. It's probably gonna change five times between now and the end of the summer. And we don't want parents to have uh, unclear expectations about or unrealistic expectations about what we will or won't be doing based on an old health policy. So two weeks prior to every camp, we'll be sharing a health policy where parents will read everything from like, you have to have a mask on when you drop your kid off. Uh, you have to, you know, like whatever all of the different rules are gonna be. Great, um, we just have a few more minutes left. I, I did get a couple questions around um, how you are handling for the in-person programs, um, hand washing and sanitation while you're at trails, et cetera, especially if there's either public bathrooms or maybe no bathrooms available. Yeah, this is definitely a big question. Uh, currently with Colorado State Licensing, they're, they're considering this and, and getting input from folks like um, Keith and I and other other camps. Um, th this one's a relatively easy one for us. I'm happy to sh share uh, specifically offline of this conversation with our systems, but we'll just carry extra squeeze bottles and water and soap and hand sanitizer 
And at our expedition-based camps, we, we have just larger hand-washing systems that we carry. Um, but, but instructors, both in their backpacks and in their cars as part of their summer kits, will have lots of hand-washing uh, supplies as well as gloves and other PPE. Great, Kat, how about another Facebook uh, question if you have one? That's it for right now. Oh, and I, I just wanna say James Moss is on this call and you know, Jim, if you wanna um, send some, if you, if you think Paul and I are making some big mistakes here, just get on the horn with us. We'd love to get your perspective about the liability side of all this. You're the expert more than anyone that we have access to. Unless Paul, you hire Jim, I don't know if you do or not. <laughs> I would love to hear Jim's voice. In the meantime, we've got a question for Paul about what license do you operate for your week-long expeditions? Oh yeah, I just replied privately back to Ashley, but our expedition camp license um, is housed underneath one of our resident camp license uh, in Colorado. Great. Let's see, any other questions? Oh, I see, well, we've got a couple minutes. I do see one about online team builders. If you all have any advice or resources for people for maybe the virtual. I don't know if you all know, I put in the chat there, there's a, a friend of mine, I, maybe she's on the call, I don't, I'm not sure. Her name's Michelle Cummings, who lives in Denver, and she has an organization called Team in Training, I think, no, I'm sorry. Does anyone know Michelle? I, um, if you look up Michelle Cummings online team building, um, she's been doing some great work over the last two months on that, so that's a good resource for you. I, I did see, I was reading, Jim, Jim had posted something which, and so I just had a chance to fully read it. And he was wondering about sort of the impact of the impact on the, on the larger population of allowing kids to come to camp at all. And I think I, as for our organization and in our discussions and sort of falling back on what I've also heard from a public health leaders roundtable that happened a few weeks ago for Northern Colorado was where public health managers like Jeff Zayak from Boulder County and other folks were saying like the importance of getting people outside right now sometimes outweighs some of the the exact protocols that are that are being described like the six foot distancing and things like that and so you know how you know what is the the larger greater benefit or concern to our community we're we're falling on the side of if we can be as responsible as possible as careful as possible, try to reduce risk as much as possible, but the, the net benefit to the community is better, but there is some additional risk that one of these kids might catch COVID from another kid and then take it home to their parents who have asthma or their grandparents who are older of age. And I don't know how to completely eliminate that risk, um, but, I, but I think our organization has decided that this is the right path forward for our mission and for our community. We may be wrong, but that's, that's, the, that's our, our best guess at it. I'm going to jump in here. I only have one real comment, and that's make sure that your insurance coverage that you think you have actually covers the pandemic. Uh, so far, I've not read a policy that does. Yeah. And so that's that's going to be the issue. If you don't have the insurance, you don't have the defense. Uh, probably you have the defense of assumption of the risk. I don't. I think it's going to be difficult to actually sue for catching a disease. Um, or we've had a million more lawsuits over the flu and common colds over the years. Um, I think signage is going to be more important. I think that I've told my clients that when or driving up to an event, as well as walking in, they need to have signage posted informing them of the risks. Um, not that everybody in the world shouldn't know about this now. Well, everybody in a world with the internet should know about this now. But I, I mean, we're still, I'm still working through it like everybody else, and I don't have any solid answers. I'm a little afraid of some of the answers that uh, I've been getting from the ACA and from other organizations. Um, the medical community, I've been on several of their talks, uh, have a lot greater fear about this than those other organizations did. Um, I have a client that was temperature testing employees when they walked in the door at eight o'clock, two o'clock that afternoon, employees said they weren't feeling well for some reason. And they had a temperature that had gone from 98 something to 101 something. 
infected all five patients she had dealt with that morning. And by the time the system was done, it infected 11 patients and killed two of them. Um, the issue that we're dealing with there was it's in the state where there's no workers comp coverage for this. And this therapist is going through massive trauma basically for what happened. And yet she had, you know, she did not know she'd come in contact with anybody and sure as heck felt well. So I think there's going to be a lot more fallout from this than, than just the simple someone gets sick. And I think that we are, the long-term effects are totally unknown at this point in time. And so the attorney has to be on the side of super paranoid and super cautious. Um, I'm getting ready to go out for a bike ride. I'm not sitting at home, you know, so I understand. But I just think that there's more than, and, and this is really hard for an attorney to say, but there's some real ethical and moral issues that we need to look at um, when dealing with this. Well, thanks, Jim. We appreciate your, your sharing your expertise here. And I know we're a little bit past four, so... Um, I just want to respect everyone's time and really thank our presenters. I think Paul had to um, leave for another engagement, but I really, again, appreciate Paul, Keith, and Stacy for making time in their busy schedules to share with us what they've learned so far. And I appreciate all of you on the call today taking your hour to um, learn some new things and hopefully spark some new ideas. So I will be sending out a follow-up email in the next day or two with the recording and some additional resources that um, were posted here um, during the webinar. But if you have any other questions, please reach out to me. And again, have a great day. Stay safe and well. And we hope to see you at a future CAE event. Thanks for putting this together, Lisa and Katie. Appreciate it. Thanks, Stacey.